So we're going to take a minute to talk about ellipses. Uh, and the reason for that is that Kepler's laws, which we developed based on circular orbits, um, actually apply to any function that fits in a family called the conic sections. So that includes ellipses and circles and parabolas and a thing called a hyperbola. Um, so any orbit that satisfies one of those four shapes is allowable under Kepler's laws. Um, in fact, a circle is just an ellipse, the same way that a square is just a rectangle. It's a, a, a rectangle that meets a certain neat little feature. So a circle happens to be an ellipse that is not <laughs> squashed this way. So the width of it this way and is identical to the width in that direction. So we're going to start off with uh, sort of the equation of an ellipse. Um, I've got myself an x and y axis here. So if, if there's x and then there's y, then the equation of an ellipse is given by x divided by some number squared plus the y divided by some other number squared equals 1. So these two numbers here, the a and the b, are what determine the width in this direction and the width in that direction. So if you are trying to write out this equation, a is the length from the center of the ellipse to the edge of the ellipse in that direction. b is the width of the ellipse from this side, from the center, to this point. And so you can see that the, the half length of this thing in the x direction goes with the x, and the half length in the y direction goes with the y. So those two numbers get some special names. Um, a would be the length of the length of the semi-major axis. Uh, major because it's the bigger one. B would be the length of the semi-minor axis. And semi is in there. Semi means half. So it's not the full width of the ellipse. It's the it's half the width of that thing. Goes up and in there. Alright, so the next neat little feature we have inside of an ellipse is called the focus. So if an ellipse has a focus here and it has a focus here. One on each side. And the definition of a focus is that it is the same distance from this edge of the ellipse as the ellipse is wide. So if the length of the semi-major axis is 10, then the point along the midline that is 10 away from here is where the focus lies. So I'm going to put in an F there to label the focus. All right. Now those points are critical. Um, if you were to draw an ellipse, you can maybe find an example online of somebody drawing an ellipse using its foci. The idea is that the if you were to draw a loop from here to here to here to here, right, like draw that triangle, and you connected it to any place on the, the ellipse, the length of that loop would be the same. There's a constant perimeter of a triangle that sketches out this particular shape. The focus then becomes the defining object, the defining feature for the shape of this ellipse. And as far as this pertains to Kepler's laws, if you are trying to put something in an elliptical orbit, then the, orbit, the object you're orbiting has to lie at one focus of the ellipse you're trying to travel on. So if you were trying to orbit the Earth on an elliptical path like this, then the Earth is located at the focus, not at the center of the ellipse, which, which would be intuitive if you think of it as a circle, but it's lying at this one end. 
So if that's the case then, there must be a distance here from the center of the ellipse to the focus, and we're going to label that as L. Uh, so if I can get up here, F, F is defined as the foci of the ellipse. And L is the focal length okay good so by definition like if you look at this little diagram I have B here I have L there and I have a there that draws a little right angle triangle like this and so by definition for Pythagorean theorem a squared must equal the focal length squared plus B squared so you can see how this thing was based on triangles and then there it is right every triangle that satisfies this particular relationship lies on this ellipse brings us to a, the last sort of quantity we can calculate about this is a thing called the eccentricity of that ellipse. So E for eccentricity is calculated by taking the focal length and dividing it by the length of the major axis, semi-major axis. So if you look at how these numbers are arranged, right, the focus is inside of the ellipse. And as long as the focus is inside of the ellipse, then L will always be less than A. And in order for L to be larger than A, that dot would have to be outside of this shape. So for any elliptical orbit, this eccentricity will be less than 1. The only way for this little fraction here to be equal to 1 is if the focal length and the uh, semi-major axis happen to equal each other. The other extreme end is if this focal length was 0. So imagine you brought these two foci to the center. If those two foci landed on each other, what you would have generated was a circle. So the ex eccentricity of an ellipse, um, if, if you get an E equal to zero, what you have there is a circle. If you have an eccentricity between zero and one, you have an ellipse. If you do this calculation and it ends up being exactly one, you've moved into the next category of conic sections, which is the parabola. So just very briefly, um, if you think about what that would look like as an orbit, so here's Earth. If you have an eccentricity of zero, then you get an orbit that is circular. I hope that looks like a circle. E equals zero. If you have an eccentricity between zero and one, you end up with an orbit that screams at you while you draw it. Doesn't look like an ellipse at all. That's better. Let's say that's E equals 0 0.5. You get an orbit that is an ellipse. It is farther away from the Earth at some points and closer to the Earth at others. If you have an eccentricity that is exactly 1, then this shape has to be a parabola. And you're very familiar with parabolas having drawn them many, 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 many times in your math classes. This is an eccentricity of exactly one. Do you notice that this object is not bound to the planet? It came from forever away, got close enough to the planet to get winged around in the other direction, and off it goes back to infinity. So you can sort of see how this particular shape is a valid orbit, right? Things can come in and get thrown back out again by the planet. If you have any eccentricity that is greater than one, then the, the focal point has to have moved outside the shape. So you end up with uh, the hyperbolic um, orbit, hyperbola. 
hyperbola comes in on a straight line, interacts with the planet, and then leaves on a straight line. So that would be any eccentricity greater than one. All right, so something in a circle would be something like our International Space Station, right, or the communication satellites. We want them traveling around in reasonably circular orbits so that they're approximately the same height above the surface of the Earth at all times. An elliptical orbit would be handy if we were trying to get close to the Earth for something and then zip away from the planet in order to get somewhere else. So if you were trying to travel to the moon, for example, if I could get an orbit that had the moon inside of it, then I'd be able to wing around the planet and then get out to that moon. If I were trying to get away from the system entirely, then this parabolic um, or hyperbolic orbit might be handy to get into because I could fling myself off of the planet. These two, of course, are very difficult to achieve because they have to be going at escape velocity in order to get out. Um, and I think in the earlier, <laughs> we did the International Space Station was traveling at seven, seven kilometers per second. Um, escape velocity for Earth is over 11 kilometers per second, which um, makes it very energetic, right? You have to have a lot of energy to do that. But if you were using the sun, as the orbiting object, and Earth was here. Say you had Earth at this particular location. Sun. If I let something fall towards the sun so that it just misses it, if I can get it on the right path, it would come in here, catch the sun, and be flung off in that direction at escape velocity so that it is slingshot out of the solar system and off on its way to wherever I'm, I want it to head to. So that's the, the idea between, behind the gravitational slingshot, is you try to get something on this hyperbolic orbit. All right, so just for math um, purposes, we're going to stick to ellipses. Um, but I did want to give you the full set of, of conic sections. Um, these will pop up if you go into university and you do anything in math or physics or engineering. So uh, <laughs> you can shiver with anticipation that that's going to happen. Um, so I'm going to clean this mess off and then we're just going to do some um, work on ellipses. Okay, so first we're going to try this one. We're going to sketch an ellipse given by that particular equation. So if I go through this list of things and I try to identify um, all of the numbers, the first one I'm going to see is this 5 down here under the x. Well, that is by definition the length of my semi-major axis. So for this example, that is 5. This number here is supposed to be b, which is the length of my semi-minor axis. So that's going to be 3. The focal length, l, I don't have that in this particular equation because this, this one is just there, it's always one. Uh, but what I do have is this Pythagorean relationship that connects L squared, B squared, and A squared. So if I just do a little quick calculation there, um, A squared is L squared plus B squared. A was 5, 5 squared is 25, B was 3, 3 squared is 9, Kick the 9 over, 25 minus 9 is 16, so L would be 4. Okay, so I have my uh, focal length. That should give me enough information to be able to sketch this thing. So if I erase my diagram here so I don't have to draw the picture on my face, giving myself an axis. I'm going to spot that my focal length, so my, my foci of my ellipse are at 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, that's here. 1, 2, 3, 4. Hopefully that's not too skewed. My semi-major axis is at 5, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 
5 is where this ellipse crosses the x on that side. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 crosses on that side. Semi-major axis is 3. 1, 2, 3, that's about here. 1, 2, 3, that's about here. And if I just try to sketch that in something like this, like that. So just using the basic numbers in the equation, I'm going to be able to work out um, where the foci are and where my semi-major and semi-minor axes lie. Just for completion, I might as well calculate the eccentricity. So for this particular ellipse, my focal length L is 4 and my semi-major axis is 5. 4 divided by 5 is 0 0.8. So an ellipse that is this stretchy, right, like that's quite, a, quite long. Um, what is this? It's 10 long and 6 wide. It's almost twice as long as it is wide. That thing has an eccentricity around 0.8, um, just to give you an idea of what that number means. Okay, so I'm going to erase this and we're going to do two more examples before we go to the practice problems. Okay, so I'm going to try and sketch an ellipse whose foci are 12 apart with the closest approach of 1. Now that, that language there, closest approach, is uh, that's orbit language. Right? If you're talking about the closest approach to Earth as you orbit around it in this ellipse, or the closest approach to Mars as you wing out and uh, try and get around the planet out there. So if I were to sketch this on an axis, uh, here we go. There's a center here somewhere. The first thing I have is that the foci are 12 apart. So if they're 12 apart, this is 12, then halfway would be 6. So I'm going to need to draw those foci at 6. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There's 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There's the other. Now, if I want this thing to have a closest approach of 1, that means I want to have uh, this ellipse be 1 away at, at minimum from my focus here. So there's two options, right? There's one on this side, there's one on that side. Uh, but you have to remember that the foci must be inside the ellipse. So that's the only available option. So there must be another one over on this side. That means that this thing, if it's one away from the focus, and the focus is six from the center, then my semi-major axis for this ellipse is seven. My focal length for this particular ellipse is six. And so I can use the Pythagorean relationship to work out how big uh, my semi-minor axis is. So L squared, uh, A squared equals L squared plus B squared. A, I just figured out, was 7. Uh, else is 6. B squared, I don't know. 7 squared is 49. 6 squared is 36. Uh, 49 minus 36 is 13. So B would be the square root of 13, um, which is approximately 3 something. 3.6. So at 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, somewhere between 3 and 4 is the length of my semi major axis, semi minor axis. So I just need to. Oops. Just need to connect those. Something like this. That's better. <laughs> this is hard to do over there. Uh, okay, so we need to get our eccentricity then just to finish. Uh, this would be 7 over 6. 7 divided by 6 is 
one. Ooh. Six over seven. Six over seven is zero point eight five seven. So this ellipse is more squashed than the last one we did, and it, and it should look longer than it is wide. Okay, so if you can sort of see this from an orbit point of view, if you're at Earth and you want to be able to send this thing to a location that is that far away, so suppose this is the Earth and that is the Moon. If I built an elliptical orbit that did this, then I would be able to wing around the planet and get out to the moon and then maybe use my thrusters to get into a different orbit around this particular body. That's why we're doing this calculation. The other detail I need to work that out then is, is how high above the Earth's surface do I need to be on this side when I execute this maneuver in order to make it work out. So that's where we're going. Um, I just wanted to do a few with some easy numbers uh, before we got there. So one more example and we're on to the practice problems. Okay, last example. I want to draw an ellipse that is 12 units long uh, with a closest approach to the foci of 2. So I'm going to start again with my axis uh, like so. And if the thing is 12 units long in total, then half of that would be 6. So my semi-major axis then is going to be 6 for this parabola or uh, ellipse. So that's here. One, two, three, four, five. Here. Okay. Now it says I have a closest approach of 2. So that means that the foci are within 2 of this edge and two of that edge, which makes my focal length one, two, three, four. The only thing left to calculate then is the length of my semi-major axis. Um, so a squared is l squared plus b squared. Uh, so six squared equals four squared plus b squared. Six squared is 36. Take out 16, gives me b squared. That's 20 equals b squared. b is the square root of 20, um, which is somewhere around, somewhere more than 4. 4.47. So at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, somewhere halfway between 4 and 5. It's my semi major axis, so I have something like so. Now just to scale, this one looks a little uh, shorter and fatter than my last one, so I'm going to expect a lower eccentricity. Uh, so E is L over A, so 4 for my focal length and 6 for my semi-major axis, uh, that's 2 thirds, 0 0.667. So, the lower this eccentricity, the more circular this orbit looks. Uh, the higher the eccentricity, the more oblong the ellipse gets. Alright, so um, in the practice questions, there's just a few ellipses for you to try and work out the A, L, and B values and eccentricity for. Uh, and then you're on to the next section where we actually do an orbit calculation.